All right, I'm going to jump right in. So I was, uh, I was listening to a talk by uh, Tim Keller that I think serves as a great runway into what I want to share with you today. All right, so um, as Christians, what's up, Alex? I love you, buddy. As, as Christians in America, we live in a very interesting time. Would you agree? Yeah. Would you agree? Okay. Uh, dialogue back and forth, that, that helps me. Okay. Yeah. We live in an interesting time. Uh, we live in a time that is much different than what it was like to be a believer in this same country 75 to 80 years ago. Uh, there are many reasons for this, um, but just for the sake of where I want to take you, I want to look at this from the perspective of the way that faith and religion is perceived. Okay? Uh, in the 1930s and 1940s, there was what you could call social pressure to be a believer. Right? Social pressure to be a believer. Um, I heard a story of a businessman who came over from Europe and he was going to start a business over here. And as he came over, he wanted to buy a house. And so he went and he visited the banker. And as he sat down to talk to the banker about a loan, the banker asked him a question. The banker said, what church do you go to? To, to which the businessman said, what does getting a mortgage have to do with going to church? And the banker said, well, if you don't go to a church or a synagogue, why would we give you a mortgage? In other words, what he was saying was, how, wh why would we trust you if you don't go to church, <laughs> right? All right, fast forward 30, 40 years, and we're into a, sort of a, a live and let live era uh, where Christians were seen as outdated a little bit that, that uh, some of our beliefs were silly, but people still saw us as ethical people. They, they liked our ethics. They, they thought that church was good for people, that it was producing good citizens in society. Um, but, but, but again, there was this live and let live era that came through. But now, increasingly, very religious or devoutly religious people, uh, uh, committed Christians, um, are beginning more and more to be seen as very narrow and exclusive, uh, so much so that some would say that we are bad for society, that, that, we're, that we're actually not good citizens, that we need to tone it down or we need to keep it private. Really, what we need to do is change, is what some would say. Um, our ethics are not admired in any way like they used to be. Again, many reasons for this, but as a whole, again, there was this social pressure that it began as, and then it moved to a live and let live and now we've moved into an era that you could call there being a social cost to being a believer. Amen? And the more that we see as believers that there's a social cost to being a believer, the more that we as believers, as Christians, are becoming private and quiet about our faith. Amen? And so for the first time in our society, we are becoming more like the Greco-Roman world in which the early church was born. That's the point I'm trying to make. We're becoming more and more. Now, our cultural setting is different. Um, we live in a, in a setting that is uh, postmodern and secular, which means that people are more likely to, to say, I don't believe there is a God at all uh, than anything. Whereas the cultural setting of the early church was polytheistic, right? Everyone had their own God. Right. Everyone had their own God. Different cities had their own gods. There was a God of various occupations. There were gods that were worshipped in homes. And there was, there was this belief that these gods, uh, that, that as you worshipped them, you, you were getting these social and experiential outcomes as you worshipped these various gods. And although you worshipped your own God, you would also observe theirs when you went into their cities and when you went into their place of business and when you went into their homes. As you would go into those places by worshipping their, their gods, you were paying homage, right? You were keeping the peace, as it were. Then came the Christians. You know that Christians... Uh, in that era, they were actually called atheists. The Christians came and they were having none of that. They believed their God was the one God. They were having none of it. And, and so although there were all kinds of beliefs in gods and religions in that culture, by far the most unpopular and persecuted religion was Christianity. 
It was Christianity. One, one historian said it this way. He said, there's nothing like the repeated and increasingly hostile stance taken by Roman authorities toward Christians. Why? Because all the other religions were willing to bow to the other gods. But Christians were so exclusive and so narrow about their God being the one and only that they were a threat to the social order. That was the cultural setting that the church was birthed in, and it's not far from where we are, and it certainly looks like where we're headed. Amen? But, but as, you, as you read the book of Acts, and this is, this is where I'm trying to go with this. This is a long intro. Forgive me. As you read the book of Acts, and as you look at historical records, what you will find is that Christianity, through all this, Christianity grew like crazy. It grew like crazy. And so the question then is, if there was no social benefit, but rather social cost in danger to becoming a Christian, then why did so many people do it? Why did they do it? I believe the reason is because they had a, com- they had a commitment to and an understanding of biblical hospitality that we are desperately lacking in our day. We're in a series that we are calling The Greatest. And throughout the ministry of Jesus, we see him emphasizing specific things that have a central theme in hospitality. All right. Now, this isn't unique because this theme runs all throughout Scripture. Right? The entire Bible is a story about hospitality as it begins with God making a home for humanity in a garden. And it ends with God making a home for believers to dwell with him in a city. In the middle of that story comes Jesus, the son of God who when he comes on the scene, when you, when you read his recorded ministry in the Gospels, what you see is that there's this trace of hospitality. And, and what, you, what you find is that hospitality wasn't just one of his strategies. It was the strategy. It was the strategy for Jesus. His ministry was all about the rescuing love and welcome of God on display. And so what is hospitality? Thanks for asking, let me tell you. Let me define it for you. Hospitality is love for the other. Hospitality is the friendly and generous care of guests, visitors, or strangers. First Peter chapter four, Peter says this in his letter, above all, keep loving one another, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. And then verse nine, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. All right. Hebrews 13, 2, probably the most famous passage on hospitality, says, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels while unaware of it. To Dr. John's point last week, uh, where he talked about the great invitation, which that message was fire. If you, were, if you were not here last week, go listen to that message. He talked about the great invitation Right, And so to his point, hospitality is the experience and announcement from sons and daughters that the love of God is here to turn all strangers into sons and all of the distanced into daughters. Now, what can we learn from our own culture on hospitality? Um, I, I think one of the ways that uh, we can take a pulse of our interaction with others is through entertainment. All right, so uh, TV shows historically do a very good job of taking a, snot, a snapshot of cultural norms, all right? And so if you study TV Neighbors, I, I, I think I showed this to some of you guys a few years ago. This is something I just sat down and I thought about historical TV Neighbors, okay? Um, I, I think there's something that we can see, all right? Because as they were presented to us historically, I think it tells us a story of how we relate to each other today. So let me give you this timeline. Are you guys, are you guys good? All right, so in the 1950s and 1960s, we were introduced to some specific neighbors, okay? So the first neighbors that, that I can recall is in 1950 when I wasn't, I wasn't alive, okay? <laughs> My mom actually, she watched the show a lot when I was growing up. Okay, so 1951, we were introduced to Fred and Ethel Mertz. Okay, when I say the show, just, just say, say the show name for me. I Love Lucy. Okay, someone over here was quick. Okay, I Love Lucy. Okay, I'm old. 
All right, so Lucy and Ricky Ricardo's landlords and best friends. Okay, those are one of the first neighbors that I remember. Okay, 1960, then we get Barney and Betty Rubble. <laughs> Flintstones, okay. Barney and Fred were homies. I, I remember even when I was a kid, people doing your mama jokes, and they were, your mama's so old that she used to gangbang with the Flintstones, right? <laughs> that was back in the day, okay. Neighbor, best friends, okay, best friends. 1968, we get Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers. Everyone wanted to live next door to Mr. Rogers. The greatest human being, right? Neighbor of all neighbors. But then as you move into the mid to late 1980s, you see a trend in neighbors that are presented to us. And these are what I would, I would argue with you, that these are some of the best TV neighbors of all time. Okay. These are the best TV neighbors. Maybe it's because I grew up in this era, but these are the, the best. But, but I, want you to, I want you to see how similar they are in character and personality. 1987, we were introduced to Kimmy Gibbler. 1989, we were introduced to Ned Flanders. 1989, we were introduced to Kramer. 1989, we were introduced to Steve Urkel. You're seeing a theme in these people. And then we move into the 90s. And we get in 1991, Wilson Wilson Jr. Okay, now this one always evades people. So this is the, the neighbor in Home Improvement who you only saw part of his face. It was really kind of a weird thing for me. Okay, Wilson Wilson Jr., 1992, we get Bruh Man from the fifth flow. Now, I knew a lot of you guys wouldn't get that one. Bruh Man from the fifth flow. If you missed that in the 90s, I need you to go back and figure it out. You missed something amazing. Okay. 1994, you get the ugly naked guy. Okay. Friends, thank you. Right. And really since then, since, since the, the early 2000s, there's nothing unique about TV neighbors that endear themselves to us, which is actually a point in and of itself, all right? And so here's what I want you guys to see in this trend. Are, are you guys awake? You guys okay? All right. No? Fair enough. All right, buddy, you want to come up here and help me? Oh, the mouths of babies. Look at this trend. Our neighbors went from being integrated into our families in the 50s and 60s to the mid 80s. They became these irritating interruptions that we just had to deal with and put up with. To the 90s, they became these mysterious and unknown people that you never could really figure out. And to now, they're negligible. This is where we are. All right, this is where we are. And so our general approach to relationship with our neighbors is to keep our neighbors at arm's length. Where this gets dangerous is that it's not just an issue in our neighborhoods. This cultural phenomenon is pervasive even in the church. Many of us want a private moralism where we worship God individually with no requirement or obligation to get involved. We become numb to this idea of hospitality and we've downgraded it to an issue of personal pre preference. But what I wanna show you today in our time that we have together is that a correct understanding and handling of hospitality is a sign of any real and true gospel faith. Okay, I wanna show you that. I wanna show you three things, okay? Table of contents, All right? Three things. Number one, I wanna show you the saver stance on hospitality. Number two, I wanna show you the spiritual strength of hospitality. And number three, the source of strength to do it well. Okay, so the Savior's stance on hospitality. I want to show you just how serious God is about our engagement with others. The spiritual significance of hospitality, what's in it for you? All right. And number three, I want to show you the source of strength to do it well. See, biblical hospitality is not instinctive. We all have a bent towards self. But when we truly understand the ways in which Jesus showed hospitality to us, it empowers us to treasure those benefits and to endure the social costs like the early Christians did it. Amen? Are you guys good to go on the ride with me?
Y'all gotta give me more energy though. Like, I, I don't understand what's happening. Am I really keeping you from the swimming pool? Chill out. All right, so first, the Savior stance. In Matthew chapter 22 and Luke chapter 10, we see two very similar scenes. In both scenes, we see a lawyer and an expert in biblical law. And he asked Jesus a question. And in both scenes, it's clear that he does so to test him. He wants to test Jesus. In Matthew 22, Jesus gives him an answer whereby he says, this is the greatest. Everyone say greatest. greatest. Jesus says, this is the greatest commandment. And in Luke 10, he gives the lawyer a parable to explain the greatest commandment, right? And so we're going to look at Luke 10 today. So Luke 10, 25, the expert asks, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus, being the great teacher that he is, turns the test around by asking the man a question. And I think Jesus knows that this man is not looking for a literal answer, right? So he turns it on him and he asks, what's written in the book of the law? How does it read to you? And the law expert, to no one's surprise, gets the answer right. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus then affirms him in his answer. And you would think that that would be the end, that it would end the conversation. But this was more than about biblical knowledge. And the reason why is because he wanted to justify himself, scripture says. Some scholars say that this man was trying to rationalize his own racial prejudice. This man, think about this with me. This man had the answers to the test and he got all the answers right, yet he was still failing. Can I suggest to you that you and I can sometimes have all the answers right and still be wrong. Like, 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 like I know you've been a Christian for a while and, and I know that you have memorized a lot of scripture and I know your church attendance is on point, but if your walk with God does not produce humility in you, it will most certainly produce defensiveness and self-justification. So the man asked Jesus, all right, well, who's my neighbor? And as, as Martin Luther King Jr. so beautifully puts it, I love how he talks about this. He says that Jesus grabs that question out of midair and places it on a dangerous curve between Jerusalem and Jericho. This man wanted to know the limits of his responsibility to others. Is neighbor a geographical term? Is it a tribal or ethnic term? Surely this word doesn't apply to everyone, does it? You know, if you, uh, if you look all throughout scripture, what you see is you see God emphasizing the importance of love and care for others. And I want you guys to see that he does this through creation and association. Everyone say creation, creation. and association. association. Okay, that's how he does it. Um, Creation association. Creation, each of us were made in the image of God, which gives us a right, which gives us a worth, which gives us a significance, a dignity, a glory that must be honored. Early in the book of Genesis, God condemns murder and he cites the sacredness of our being made in the image of God as the reason why. All right. Even in the book of James, cursing each other is condemned because we were made in God's likeness. There's something there's something so valuable about human beings that not only may we not be murdered, but we can't even be cursed without receiving our just due because of the image of God that's on us. And so the, the image of God carries with it the right to not even be mistreated or harmed. All right, C.S. Lewis in his famous sermon, Weight of Glory, makes this point better than I can. He says this, says, next to the blessed sacrament itself, your neighbor is the holiest object presented to your senses. Martin Luther King Jr. talked a lot about the image of God. The image of God was at the very heart of the civil rights movement. Um, and and it's in his sermon, The American Dream, I want you to hear what Martin Luther King Jr. said. He said, you see, the founding fathers were really influenced by the Bible. The whole concept of the Imago Dei, as it is expressed in Latin, the image of God, is the idea that all men have something in them that God injected. We must never forget this as a nation. There are no degradations in the image of God. 
Every man from a treble white to a bass black is significant on God's keyboard precisely because every man is made in the image of God. Amen. Amen. God, through creation, emphasizes hospitality. But God also does this through association. You know, it's crazy um, as you scan, as you canvas scripture, as you read scripture, how often God is introduced as a defender of vulnerable groups. You see this over and over again. Now, what's wild about this is that as you study history, when you look at history, the way that deities would infuse themselves and ingratiate themselves into a culture and into a civilization is they would always click up with the rich and the elite. They would always do that. Why? Because the rich and the elite have the influence to spread their belief systems. The rich and the elite have the ability to spread their rituals, to get their rituals. The rich and the elite had the ability to build them their temples. But as you read the Bible, you see the God of the Bible doesn't do that. In fact, in scripture, you hear God saying things like, I'm a defender of the widow. I love the poor. I am a father to the fatherless. Over and over again, we see this. It's completely different. Deuteronomy 10, verse 18, he, he executes justice for the orphan and the widow and shows his love for the foreigner by giving him food and clothing. Psalm 146, 9, the Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the ways of the wicked. See, hospitality was a problem in Judaism because they were the chosen people, right? They were the chosen people. This made them particularly loyal to their own kind and led them to neglect and even condemn those who were not Israelites, and so as you read the Mosaic law, you see that God is always talking about this, that he's always trying to curtail this attitude through the law of gleaning, right? And through the law of jubilee and tithe and the law of release. All of these were put in place to care for the vulnerable. And the logic was clear, right? The logic was very clear. The logic was remember where you came from. You were once slaves in Egypt. You were the vulnerable ones. And so hospitality wasn't just an issue of charity or private preference to the people of God. It was an issue of justice. That's what it was. Now we are, we're in a cultural moment right now where one of the biggest discussions and debates you could even say is about the vulnerability of particular groups, isn't it? All right. The, the issue of abortions front stage right now, the overturning of Roe v. Wade, front stage right now. One side argues that it's about the vulnerability of women and their rights. Another side argues that it's about the vulnerability of children and the rights of the unborn. And, uh, you know, let me just give you full disclosure here. Right? Like, I, I know everyone in here has a story that they can tell, but I have the mic, so I'll share mine. <laughs> you know, I was, I was born out of wedlock. My mom and dad were not staying together. And by the time I came on the scene, it was over, over. And so, did my parents contemplate aborting me? Let me give you the answer, yes. But as you can imagine, I'm grateful that my mom thought better of it. I'm grateful that my mom chose humiliation, or excuse me, chose me over humiliation, right? That my mom, she chose me over a career setback. She chose me over the difficulty of raising a child as a single woman. That's what she did. Amy and I, at age 18, we had only known each other for a couple months and we had only been dating for a couple months and we became pregnant. It's quiet in here. Come on, keep going. Come on. We didn't even know if we wanted to be committed to each other long-term at this point. And so for us, I mean, we were thinking to ourselves, we're 18, like we can't afford to, to raise a child and we knew what it meant to our lives. And so the question is, 
did we think about abortion? Did that thought come into our heads? I want to confess to you. Yes. But we quickly shoot the thought away. You know why? Because we knew it was murder. We knew that we were doing this. To, we had done this to ourselves. And so in that moment, we chose the child over humiliation. And I'm telling you, that was a humiliating time. We had to confess to our family. We had to confess to our friends. Uh, Amy had to confess to her faith community. And let me just tell you, I, I love you. I love you. Let me just tell you, Amy was almost born in her church. And so when she had to go hat in hand and tell everyone who was inspired by her life that she was pregnant, I've never seen her go through something so hard. And right about the time that the confession tour was over and we were warming up to this idea of bringing this child into the world, April 1st of that year, we miscarried. Our relationship was over. We were done. Like the miscarriage absolutely ended everything. The only reason why we stayed together is because very shortly after I came to faith that I encountered Jesus. Jesus encountered me and I completely changed. That's the only thing that saved us. And so for us, for everything we went through with this miscarriage, you know, not just our conviction, but even in our experience, man, abortion is just not really something that we can entertain. But I want you to hear me out. I want you to hear me out on this. Because if you want to know who the vulnerable ones are in abortion, let's just do a little research. Okay? Do a little research. The Gut Mocker Institute is a secular research organization that started out as a branch of Planned Parenthood because of, uh, now be, because of their association. I'm sure you can guess what their bias is, right? They are, um, they are all for... Uh, abortion rights. But in 2004, they did a study. I want you to hear this. They did a study in 2004 and they cited the two top reasons why women get abortions. Guys, and let me just take a step back. This is our issue, by the way. If you're frustrated at me because I'm talking about abortion, like, like this, this is actually what is wrong with the American church. Is we're going to talk about the stuff that's important. So, so listen up, listen up. Secular study, okay? Secular study. Listen to me. Secular study. They cited the two top reasons why women were getting abortions. And this was also a study that was done in 1987 as well. But 2004, the two top reasons, 74% of abortions were having a baby would dramatically change my life. And secondly, I can't afford a baby right now. In the 1987 study, go look this up. The 1987 study, those were also the two top reasons why abortion was happening. In that same study, those who were aborting due to rape and incest, 1% of the documented cases, both 1987 and 2004, 1% of it. And so here's what I wanna to say to you. When we insist that all people from every nation, every tribe, every tongue are created equal, when we insist that men and women are equal, we pull that from the same truth that insists that every child, every unborn child in a mother's womb is made in the likeness and image of God. Now, 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 now. Now, don't get it twisted, okay? Because here's the deal, man. A lot of us are dancing around and celebrating all the stuff that's going on right now. I think compassion is actually a really good posture right now. Because don't get it twisted. No one defended the rights of women better than Jesus. No one did that. Uh, Rebecca McLaughlin, she's a, an English uh, Christian author and apologist. And she talks about this in her book, The Secular Creed. She talks about how when you look at scripture, what you'll see is that Jesus defended the right of a notoriously sinful woman to weep at his feet. Jesus defended the right of an unclean woman to touch his garment. Jesus defended the right of a spiritually hungry woman to learn from him. 
Jesus defended the right of a disabled woman to be healed on the Sabbath, citing that she was a daughter of Abraham. Jesus defended the right of the woman caught in adultery to live. And he refused to judge her knowing that he would one day take that judgment on himself. Jesus should have never been caught dead with the woman from Samaria at the well. But you know what he did? He offered her living water. And not only did he do that, in the book of John, she is the first person that he reveals verbally his identity of being the Messiah. Jesus should have never touched the little dead girl. Yet he grabbed her by the hand and he said, Talitha Kumi, little girl, get up. No wonder why women flocked to Jesus. Oh, by the way, they still do. They still do. Um, if you uh, look at the historical records, you see in the Greco-Roman Empire into which Christianity was born, th that, that empire was majority male. It was majority male, right? And there's a few reasons for this. There was women were dying in childbirth. But then also there was the selective abandonment of little baby girls. But do you know this? From all historical records that we have, do you know that the early church was majority female? Majority female. Look at the global church today. Majority female. And it's not because women are more religious than men, by the way. Okay, go study Islam. Go study Mormonism. And you'll see the gender disparity there. Okay, there's a distinctiveness of Christianity that draws all men, but women absolutely respond to it. Look at the church in China. Again, another place like the Greco-Roman Empire where there's way more men than women. And the reason why for them is they have a, a selective abortion of little baby girls. The church in China, majority female. The church in America, majority female. See, there's this narrative out there that the central plank of women's rights is abortion. But I just want to tell you guys right here, right now, that the central plank of women's rights, the very thing that empowers women, the very thing that ascribes value to them, the very thing that looks them in their face and says, you are everything. You know what it is? It's the cross. That's what it is. Hospitality, by way of compassion, by way of, uh, of concern and care and movement towards the vulnerable, it's woven all throughout scripture. Why? Because it is the very beating heart of God. That's why. And so in response to the law experts question, Jesus tells a story. You guys still doing okay? Yeah. Okay. Jesus tells a story. Luke 10, 30, Jesus says, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among robbers and they stripped him and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. And by chance, and the way I always read this is by sheer chance, by miracle. This is the worst day of this man's life, but by miracle, a priest is walking down the road. Things can't get any worse for this man, but a priest is coming. All things are going to change. This priest comes and was going down that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. It's okay though, because likewise, a Levite, I mean, gosh, lightning strikes twice in a day. Lightning, like, man, the priest, he passed me up. Maybe he didn't see me, but a Levite is coming now. And when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him. And when he saw him, he felt compassion. And if I'm that guy on the road, man, half dead, I'm seeing a Samaritan coming. I'm like, man, if I, thought, if, if I wasn't dead already, the Samaritan comes and it says, he bandaged up his wounds, 
pouring oil and wine on them and put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him and whatever more you spend when I return, I will repay you. See, many readers of this parable spend a lot of time speculating why the priest and the Levite didn't stop. Why didn't they stop to help this man? I mean, if anyone should have stopped to help this man, it should have been them, right? They had every reason. This is their brother in the faith. The Mosaic law, to which they should have known very well, charges them to love their neighbor, but they miss it. And I want you to also see Jesus doesn't even speak to this. And I wonder if it's because he knows that that's what many of us would do. I mean, think about it. You're on a road, a dangerous road, and you see someone hurting. I think many of us would just make a business decision in that moment, right? We just say, I'm out. Yeah. But when the Samaritan came along, Samaritans, again, remember this in scripture, Samaritans and Jews were the bitterest of enemies, right? Samaritans were seen as uh, racial half-breeds and religious heretics, right? And so there was great animosity between them, yet the Samaritan saw the man on the road, he was moved with compassion, and he did something. That's what this series is about, guys. Do something. Do something. We are all educated beyond our level of obedience. Do something. Jesus is answering this man's question of who is my neighbor by depicting a man meeting material, physical, and economic needs through deeds. Jesus is saying that hospitality and neighborly love means being sacrificially involved with the vulnerable. All right. And so here's the Savior's stance. Here's the Savior's stance. By depicting a Samaritan helping a Jew, Jesus could not have found a more forceful way to say that anyone at all in need, regardless of race, regardless of politics, regardless of class, regardless of religion, is your neighbor. And so what is the spiritual significance of hospitality? Huh? Why should I do it? What's in it for me? I think the reason why hospitality is so difficult for us is because it is a direct assault at the thing that is fundamentally wrong with us, right? We, we are all selfish by nature. A Christian author and, and counselor, Lou Priolo, he calls selfishness the mother of all sins. It is the sin that spawns them all. It's from the love of self that all other inordinate loves flow. John Calvin said it this way. He said, we shall never love our neighbors with sincerity according to our Lord's intention until we have corrected the love of ourselves. The two affections are opposite and contradictory. See, because man is sinful, God's practical remedy for him is to learn how to love God and learn how to love his neighbor. That's the practical remedy, right? That, that these two are the, the most practical antidotes for indwelling sin. That the more that you love God, and the more you love your neighbor, the less selfish and sinful you will be. That's the key, guys. And so selfishness is this overarching issue, right? It's an overarching issue, but out of it spawns these other issues of fear and judgment and a faulty view of our own lack and sufficiency. And until you address these things and serve and love your neighbor anyway, you'll never overcome them. You'll never overcome. So let's look at a few of these. All right. So with fear, I think it's fair for us to assume that the priest and the Levite, as they passed this man down the road, they thought the road was unsafe. They thought the man was unsafe. Maybe the robbers were still around, they thought. Maybe the man was faking it and this was a trap. I mean, surely this must have been in their mind to think safety first. Maybe, maybe that's where they were. In our American lifestyle, we've become obsessed with safety, almost to a point where we've become risk averse, by the way. And I just want to, I'll confess to you guys, far too often, I'm thinking safety over obedience to God. This is what I do. But what would have happened? What would happen if our biblical heroes chose safety over obedience? What would have happened? Moses would have never stepped to Pharaoh. 
David would have never stepped to Goliath. Paul would have never written two-thirds of the New Testament, most from which came from a jail cell. Jesus would have never stepped to the cross. My hero, Martin Luther King Jr., I'm, you know, so frustrated. Most of us love him because of the things he said and the things that he did. I just want you guys to know, in his day, he was despised. Okay? And so Martin Luther King, you know, he walked around every day knowing that his life was in there. They slayed that brother in the streets. I just want to make sure you remember that. And he walked around every day knowing that his life was in danger, but he saw the call of God and what he was doing for humanity worth that risk. For his own family was worth that risk. Jim Elliott, the dear missionary who was martyred while bringing the gospel to an unreached people, he said this, the safest place to be is at the center of God's will. See, our faith does not revolve around safety, nor does it grow if safety is our only and ultimate concern. Now, now listen, I'm not telling you to be foolish. I'm not telling you to be a dummy. Don't go out here lying on me, okay? That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is if your knee jerk is me first, that's where the issue is, all right? And so we must be rooted in obedience and in sensitivity to God's leading, okay? Secondly, so we, we looked at fear, judgment. You know, maybe the, the, the Levite and the priest saw the man in the road and they thought he got there by his own doing. Right? It's easy to speculate that the reason why people end up in dire need is at least it's got something to do with their own irresponsible actions. Right? Jesus said this. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit. But I think many of us are like uh, Tim Keller in his book, Generous Justice. He says many of us are, you know, we, w- we want to be seen as poor in spirit, but many of us are actually more middle class in spirit. <laughs> We're middle class in spirit. So maybe you feel like you've earned a certain standing with God through your hard work. Like the successes and the resources you have are primarily due to your own industry and energy. But while the Bible does agree with you, let me just be clear. The Bible does agree with you that your industriousness and your grind is an irreplaceable reason why you're successful. It is not the main reason. If you were born on a mountaintop in Tibet in the 13th century, instead of a Western country in the 20th century, it wouldn't matter how hard you worked, you wouldn't have a whole lot to show for it. And so let me just say this to you, and I love you, so please receive this from me. If you have money, if you have power, if you have status today, it is because of the century and the place you were born. It is because of your health, your capacity, and your talent, none of which you earned. See, people who come to grasp the gospel of grace and become spiritually poor find their hearts gravitating towards the materially poor. To the degree that the gospel shapes your self-image, you will identify with those in need. It becomes really hard to judge others. You'll see their tattered clothes and you'll say, man, my righteousness is but filthy rags. Nothing less than the death of the Son of God can save me. I'm clothed in his robes. When you see the economically poor, you can't say to them, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps because you certainly didn't do that spiritually. Jesus intervened for you. And you can't say, I won't help you because you got yourself into that position. You can't say that either. And the reason why is because God came to earth. He moved into your spiritually poor neighborhood. And he met all your needs, all your spiritual problems, even though they're your own fault. In other words, when Christians who understand the gospel see a poor person, they realize they are looking in a mirror. Their hearts must go out to them without an ounce of superiority or indifference. You know, the priest and the Levite, for all their religious training, for all that they knew in religious community, they did not know how to recognize their bond with this man on the street, but the Samaritan did. Lastly, I want to go to our last point here. We saw the Savior's stance. 
there's a constant thread all throughout scripture where God is emphasizing hospitality. We saw the, the spiritual significance that by loving our neighbor, we are able to grow out of the things that hinder our growth and they address the very things that are wrong with us. But lastly, I want you to see the source of strength to do this well. All right. The law expert asked Jesus, he said, who is my neighbor? And through this one story, Jesus absolutely blitzed him with answers, right? In this one story, Jesus shows the man, my neighbor is hurting. My neighbor needs help. My neighbor are those who cannot help themselves. My neighbor is someone who appears on my path. My neighbor is someone who's unable to ask for help. My neighbor is of a different race. My neighbor is a stranger. My neighbor is someone I'm afraid to help. My neighbor is someone who's too dangerous to help. My neighbor looks horrible. My neighbor is of a different religion. My neighbor is a victim of injustice. My neighbor can't say thank you. My neighbor is someone no one wants to help. My neighbor will cost me. My neighbor will cost me time. It'll cost me money. My neighbor can't repay me. Jesus was trying to make the point, your neighbor is everyone in need. Everyone. Jesus ends the story with a question of his own. So the man started this by asking a question. But then Jesus asks him a question. Jesus says to this man, who was the neighbor to the man on the road? And I want you guys to see this in the story, that this law expert couldn't even say the word Samaritan, but he had to admit it. And so he said, it was the one who showed mercy on him. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. Amen. Let's stand together. Let's stand together. You know, one of the, the most interesting twists to this parable was the placement of the Jewish man in the story. The placement of the Jewish man. Remember, Jesus is talking to a Jewish man. He's talking to a law expert. But instead of placing a Samaritan on the road as a victim, he put a Jew in the road. In other words, he was asking the man to imagine himself as the victim of injustice and of violence dying with no hope if the Samaritan didn't stop to help him. Wouldn't you want the Samaritan to act a certain way? Wouldn't you want him to rescue you? Wouldn't you want him to be a neighbor to you across all racial and religious barriers? This is the question that Jesus is asking us today. I want you to hear this. This is, this is the main point. What if your only hope was to get ministry from someone who not only didn't owe you any help, but actually owed you the exact opposite? What if your only hope was to get free grace from someone who had every justification based on his relationship to you to trample you? See, this law expert couldn't see what we can because we are on the other side of the cross. Because we are like that man dying on the road, that we are spiritually dead in our trespasses and sins, the Bible says in the book of Ephesians. But when Jesus came into our dangerous world, he came down our road. And though he had been our enemies, and though we had been his enemies, he was moved with compassion by our plight. He came to us and he saved us. And as he saved us, he didn't just do this as a risk to his life, like in the case of the Good Samaritan. No, he did it at the cost of his life, which means this, that Jesus is the great Samaritan to whom the Good Samaritan points. Amen, amen. No, but before, before you can give this neighbor love, it's important that you know that you need to first receive it. Can't give it away if you don't have it. This is a source of strength you need to do it well, that only if you see that you have been saved graciously by someone who owes you the exact opposite of what he's given you, can you go out into the world looking to help absolutely everyone 
and need. And once we receive this ultimate radical neighbor love and hospitality through Jesus Christ, you and I can graciously give it away. Amen. With all heads bowed, all eyes closed. You're here today and you would say, Sean, I am in desperate need of the welcome of God in my life. That I didn't know this about Jesus, that he came specifically to this world to come down my road and to save me. And if you're here today and you would say, Sean, that is me. I'm like that man dying in the road and I need the great Samaritan. I need Jesus. Just slip up your hand. I want to pray for you. Slip up your hand. Okay, good. We're all believers in here. Maybe you're here today and you would say, Sean, I am way too much like the priest and Levite. I'm way too much like the law expert who would love to justify himself. But I am crippled by fear. I'm crippled by selfishness. I'm crippled by a faulty understanding of who I really am. And it's keeping me from the neighbor love and the hospitality that God has called me to offer. If you would say that's you, just slip your hand up. I want to pray for you as well. Amen. 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 Again, in the days to come, I really want to strip us from this. I believe the superpower of the church is to love people in their orbit so well that they can't help but understand the goodness of God that's welcoming them in. And so, Father in heaven, I just thank you for your people. And I thank you, God, that you did not just save us so that we could just be beacons of light here on the earth that stays still and doesn't do anything. Lord, but may our light so shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify you in heaven. Jesus, help us to be a people that don't just sit back. Help us to be a people who engage. Help us to be a people who push past the social cost and love the world well. We'll give you all the glory. We'll be very careful of that in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Amen.